All right. Um, I think we can start. Uh, my name is Stephanie Fenke, and I'm director of the International Institute for Peace. And today we talk about Hungary's emergency law and the COVID-19 crisis. I'm very, very happy that uh, Peter Greco is uh, here with us. Uh, he is the director of the Political Capital Institute based in Budapest. It's a think tank. And he's also a fellow at the IWM, which is the Institute of Human Sciences based in Vienna. So thank you very much for joining us today from Budapest, giving us some insights. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I would also, of course, like to welcome Hannes Woboda. He's the president of the IIP and former MEP, and he has a broad knowledge about the region. And I'm also very happy that you are here today to discuss together with us. Uh, so welcome, Hannes. Thank um, you. It's an interesting discussion. Mm, uh, so do I. And maybe just for the procedure for the attendees, I would say that I just give a very broad, um, a very short uh, introduction question to Mr. Greco. So he will start um, analyzing the situation within within um, uh, Hungary now in, for the next 10 minutes. And then we switch to Hannes. And then you can also, for the participants, you can also already, if uh, something comes up to your mind, use, of course, the... Um, the Q&A session there, if you have questions, so later on that I will go through it all the time and we can then take a look. Um, Peter, um, many countries uh, due to the pandemic have uh, introduced quite restrictive measures and it has also been looked upon, especially also by some Western uh, European countries with, um, um, I would say, vigilant uh, on what has been happening in, in Hungary. I mean, I'm talking especially of the emergency law. It has been discussed widely. And uh, uh, my question to you would be, how is the situation now in Hungary? How is the situation within the country? Maybe a division between, between the big cities, Budapest and the rural areas. How do people react to the measures introduced? And how do they also see like from a political side? Because we have been talking about the criticism, the white criticism that Hungary is sliding against uh, more into uh, an uh, autocracy, like some have even been talking about first steps towards uh, dictatorship. And here I'm talking, of course, of the emergency law, which uh, allows uh, Viktor Orban to rule by decree. So um, please, what are your initial thoughts? Uh, what, how would you assess the situation in this context? So <clears throat> thanks much, Stephanie, for, for these uh, questions. And also thanks, Hans, and then both of you for, for having me. I'm, I'm really glad that we can discuss these issues in such, such a good company. Um, so I, um, I will start with saying that um, Hungary is uh, fitting rather well to the list of the Central Eastern European countries where the pandemic uh, seemed to have less impact than in most of the countries in Western Europe. So if we take a look at the number of, uh, of people who uh, were infected and at least registered as infected with lower levels of testing, we have to add to that as well, um, these figures are considerably lower auction-wise in most Central Eastern European countries than in, in uh, Western Europe, which gives some, uh, let's say, possibility for the politicians in the region to talk about their own success in, in tackling the coronavirus. Uh, and we don't really know what is the reason why Central Eastern Europe seems to be less infected, but most probably is the combination of two reasons. One is that they are simply less integrated in the uh, global economy and the, and the, uh, and especially in the first round, the, um, the virus rather followed the roots of global trade and, and, uh, economy. And the second thing is that uh, uh, because of that, the virus appeared earlier uh, in Western Europe than in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, therefore, the lockdowns began earlier, at an earlier stage, and they seem to work rather well. I think the Hungarians were rather principled in following the lockdown rules according to uh, most measures and even the measures of, of Google that, that track the movement of the people and, and so on. Um, and of course, lockdown measures and so on, they have no problem. I mean, you can find them everywhere. Also, you can find emergency measures in uh, most of the uh, countries within the European Union, but at the same time, you can never find uh, emergency measures 
that are abused so deeply as they have been abused in Hungary in the last uh, uh, two months, practically. And um, also, you nowhere else have a government that have 10 years of track record of democratic backsliding. Hungary is the only country that is um, classified as a partly free country, as a hybrid regime, according to Freedom House, and the first country in the history of the European Union that is classified as a partly free country. Uh, as as um, part of the uh, EU, and I will tell some examples how the emergency law was used and abused by the uh, government. But at the same time, I have to tell that we don't have to be obsessed only with the emergency law, with this enab enabling act. Viktor Orban has a political support of, I mean, he has the support of two-thirds of the of the uh, members of the parliament is a constitutional majority and he has a grip over most of the institutions for example the the prosecutor's office the constitutional court and so on so if you have almost all the institutions then how do you achieve your political will is just a question of of the instruments of it's a question of technicality this is not the most important issue the most important issue is the content of the decisions <clears throat> and right now because of the fact that at the end of may the uh, uh, emergency uh, situation in hungary will be terminated uh, the governmental narrative is that Look, you you told <clears throat> that there will be an indefinite dictatorship in Hungary, and we are just exiting this. So nothing to see here, no problem here, and no one should fall to this trap to accept this argument. Let let me come up with some uh, specific examples on on what happened in the last uh, two months. I would put the measures in. Uh, in four broader categories. First, there were quite a lot of measures in that consolidating the economic power of the government and government close oligarchs, and oligarchs really, really close to the prime minister himself. For example, the most important uh, measure in this line is uh, the classification, classifying the uh, Budapest Belgrade railway line uh, a project of 3 billion euros, 3 billion euros, that is important uh, for China, not only for its own sake, but also because it opens the doors for other uh, investments and projects in the European Union with licenses and, and, uh, and as an important uh, flagship uh, project. So this project has been classified. We will not know too much about the details of the contracts, but we, what we know for sure is that Lurin Smysaros, a very, very, very close friend to the prime minister, uh, according to Forbes, the most wealthy man in Hungary, is the primary Hungarian uh, subcontractor of this project. So uh, it seems to follow much more private interest than public interest. And there are many other measures that are in a quite nepotistic way, uh, are favoring given the son-in-law of the prime minister and the closest colleagues of the prime minister. And this, this, some of these projects were given priority. Some of these projects were taken out of the traditional tender procedure. So there was a lot of easing towards uh, this project. So this is one block, strengthening the uh, and cementing even more the already brutal economic power of uh, the pro-governmental interests. <clears throat> Second, measures aimed at reducing the rights and funds of municipalities. For example, there was a parking fees were suspended across the country, which cuts the revenues of the municipalities. Why is it important? In big cities, especially, uh, the uh, opposition parties and opposition politicians are um, overrepresented in the municipalities. So municipalities are the strongholds right now of the opposition. So what does the government do? First of all, take away a lot of um, development funds from them, some of the revenues, some of the tax revenues, and um, also uh, and state subsidies. And also what happened, for example, is that uh, um, there was a law that was passed in the parliament according to which the government can uh, create so-called eco special economic zones that do not... Uh, pay the tax for the municipality, but they pay the tax for the so-called county municipality. Why is it important? County municipalities are all in Fidesz hands. So again, taking away the rights, taking away the uh, revenues. Um, and this is from an allegedly conservative government that seems to totally uh, centralize everything and go against the very idea of 
of uh, local governance. Third package, measures aimed at intimidating and silencing opponents and strengthening the power grab. What happened in the last few days in Hungary is that several people were brought to police because they posted something on Facebook that was critical towards the government's uh, measures uh, in the economic, uh, in the uh, handling the the uh, virus. And I think we can see quite a lot of such scenes in Russia, in Azerbaijan, not so much in the in the European Union generally. And some of the there were almost 90 investigations started because of uh, spreading hoaxes. What did the government do? They they passed the law according to which. Um, uh, so restriction of the uh, criminal code allows to put people for five years in jails, uh, jail because of, of spreading uh, false uh, information or distorted information. There were 90 investigations started. Police went out to a lot of people. And then most of the investigations dropped. So right now the government can say that, you know, nothing to see here. But the message is clear. And everybody could see the pictures in TV that people are brought to police because they posted something governmental critical that distorted the facts. Uh, also, what, what happened is that there were... Uh, not real uh, public gatherings, but uh, anti-government, uh, let's say, protests where people were sitting in their cars or sitting on their bicycles and just pulling the Trump or, or using their, their uh, ring. And the police find a lot of these people. They find several hundreds of people hundreds of people because of that and these tiny little signs of silencing the uh, critical voices it was not really typical in hungary uh, the hungarian let's say hybrid regime was much more elegant uh, so far and the police tried to avoid always the uh, impression that it's it's uh, it works in a politically biased way right now it works in an obviously politically biased way and the fourth and last package would be measures in that provoking ideological conflicts and measures that have really nothing to do to, uh, with the pandemic. For example, not allowing transgender people to officially change their gender. It definitely helps uh, to tackle the coronavirus. Uh, also, and I, th I think this is the most outrageous one from a hu basic human rights standard. Uh, adopting a declaration that it rejects the Istanbul Convention. So Hungary not just not, uh, not uh, implemented the Istanbul Convention, uh, but also be reject uh, to, to, to declare it. So, and and these, these are signs that really show that two months for the government was absolutely enough to do a very, uh, very uh, strong authoritarian shift from an already quite authoritarian position. And yeah, I, I think um, these interpretations that, that tell that um, the COVID-19 uh, really gave a momentum for this illiberal shift of the government are, are totally right. We will see what happens in the, in the next period. I think the government will face hard time to save its popularity uh, in the times of an, an economic crisis. And probably that was the reason why they found this moment important to have an even stronger power grab than before. Thank you very much, Peter, for this uh, um, initial statement. And I think you mentioned already very important points when it comes also to the decline of uh, basic human rights. I mean, you mentioned the, the fake news paragraph, I mean, which allows people to, to be in prison up to five years and also the transgender law and also the rejection of the Istanbul Convention. Hannes, um, now uh, for you, from a point of view from the European Union, I mean, we have, uh, we know 27 states, different opinions. We heard, for example, that uh, Sebastian Kurz, the Austrian Chancellor, mentioned we have now different things to do than to occupy ourselves with the ongoings uh, within um, Hungary, for example, on the one hand. But on the other hand, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, I mean, she was mentioning that an infringement proceeding could be thinkable in case if the measures are not proportionate on, and uh, if the possibility of uh, democratic control is lacking, which uh, has been one of the major claims. My question to you would be now, considering that Hungary before 2010, when Fidesz came to power, actually was also um, a front runner of the democratization process in, in this region, uh, but now is visibly, I would say, um, diverging from these values and principles from the European Union. What could the European Union actually do and what should it do? 
Yeah, uh, I remember when I was still in the European Parliament and we had Orban uh, there. I said to him, uh, he speaks very often about traitors, that he is treating more or less uh, the Hungarian Revolution because the Hungarian Revolution was in '56 when I was young uh, and I realized that was a revolution towards uh, liberation, not freedom. And then, of course, uh, with the doing away with the Iron Curtain. Uh, it's very strange how Orban himself had this movement from being some liberal, open-minded uh, fighter for freedom uh, in going to some sort of a very authoritarian system. Now, what could the European Union do? They could do more. That's true. We always have, uh, when in the parliament and still today, is the same, uh, put pressure on the commission. I understand to a certain extent the, the, the restraint of the commission, the hesitant. Uh, of the Commission because uh, uh, there's a European Court and the European Court said only those elements can be called illegal and can be sanctioned by the European Commission which are violating European law. So even if it's undemocratic in some way but not violating European law, it is very difficult. Now the European Commission tries to extend it um, but um, maybe in this case Van der Leyen was also supported by Orban, that he was a bit more timid and uh, restrictive. Uh, maybe already there was some deal that Orban said, well, I will leave measures anyway uh, very soon, so don't do any uh, infringement against uh, me. Probably there was some, some deal like that, unfortunately, because uh, before the decision was taken by the commission, I was participating in the discussion, discussion with uh, Commissioner Reinders, who is responsible for that. that it was very clear against the measure, so I was surprised. And what you mentioned already, there are many countries who are either sympathetic towards what Orban is doing, or at least saying, ah, don't interfere in international affairs. Now, Poland is very sympathetic in many elements, not in the, in the uh, evaluation of the role of Russia. Here they are different, because the one Orban is Russian, uh, Putin friend, they are, the others are the Polish, are of course, very much against uh, Putin. Um, if you look to Kurz, he is um, at least has some sympathies for Orban on the refugee issue, for example. But even if you look to some elements, I don't want to compare because it's uh, uh, it would uh, let's say diminish the effect or the the ugliness of the Hungarian measures if we would say that we have the same in Austria. But there's some tendency. Look now, the fight against Vienna. Vienna is uh, opposition run, so we have to criticize uh, Vienna, the red capital. Uh, some nepotism uh, is, is also see, can be seen that those organizations who are close to the, the Austrian Chancellor get a lot of support, also financial support. Um, what is uh, and the role of the police has been very often criticized by many people. The, the, the way how they wanted to implement the measures. What is different, of course, is the Istanbul Convention here. There is no, no any idea uh, in, in Austria to, to, to lift it or to, to say it's violating some basic Christian rights. So, yes, um, we are not similar, we are not uh, equal, of course, but there is some understanding in some elements that there is some right-wing um, tendency, which you can find in several European countries, not in all of them, but in several European countries, which are at least accepting the authoritarian way some countries uh, lead, some prime ministers, some governments lead. And that is, of course, really violating the basic philosophy, the basic principles of the European Union. Because, and with this I want to finish, after the Second World War, very often is in Austria is said EU is some economic institution. Yes, it is also one. But the basic reason to form European Union was not the economic one, was the fight against uh, extremism, the fight against racism, the fight against racial prejudices, and against authoritarian systems, uh, and for democracy. And if we tolerate what is happening in Hungary and some other countries, we in some way uh, violating the basic principles the European Union has been built upon. 
Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. I mean, uh, Peter, maybe also that you also can reflect a little bit on the situation of the European Union. I mean, we know quite well that um, uh, Hungary is actually a net receiver, so um, he's, it's profiting quite well from the European Union. But if you listen to the narrative of Viktor Orban within Hungary, what he says about the European Union, we have the feeling that it's more actually a, a bashing even of the European Union, even though... Um, he's profiting. What would you say on, 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 on the role of the European Union when it comes to Hungary? I mean, what, what means does it have? And maybe also reflect a little bit on what Hannes said uh, on, the, on the value situation of the European Union, because they are actually in Article 2, so the, the, the values of the European Union and human rights, they are actually written there, so it is uh, also European law, which should also be applicable to, to Hungary in this sense. Please. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie, for for these these very relevant points. Uh, I would start with saying that uh, Orban, I think, is a is really a master of navigating through very complex uh, institutional structures, and also he can benefit from the fact that he's in the European Union and the, the European Council for a decade now. Uh, only Chancellor Merkel is is uh, he, she is the only chancellor who who has more experience on how the EU is working from within as as a uh, prime minister and um, and what he uh, I think uh, really well uh, recognize is that um, there will be always interests for uh, saving Hungary from any. Uh, severe uh, punishment. I mean, it's a club where where the clubs members of the club are equal, and you can have many benefits of of having an ally now uh, that can can be returned later. And and I think Orban is rather well in this transactional logic. I mean, uh, we we could find strange alliances, for example, when the president of the European Commission was was uh, selected between Emmanuel Macron and, and Viktor Orban. And uh, even Manfred Weber himself told that these are the two guys who are mainly responsible for his failure of becoming uh, president of the European um, Commission. So some depict Orban as a, let's say, as a very inward-looking nationalistic position, but he's really not. He, he understands well, I think, the logic of the uh, European Union, and <clears throat> he knows that Commission of the uh, Euro I mean, the logic of the European Commission is is usually always to go to the let's say towards the smallest uh, conflict possible. The logic of the European Parliament is that uh, that um, if you are strong enough, then there will be enough advantages of keeping you in the club, even if you uh, misbehave. Plus, that that European parties are extremely divided. And uh, also, he knows well that in the European Council, by the end of the day, no one will be really, I mean, no one in the Eastern Bloc will be really interested in, let's say, um, activating the nuclear option, uh, which would mean the withdrawal of the voting rights of Hungary, because, uh, because new member states can feel that they can be annexed. And I think this is an important uh, thing to know that uh, in Central Eastern Europe and Eastern Europe, there is a general perception that human rights and rule of law is a rhetorical tool to punish Eastern new member states by, by, the, uh, by the old member states. And, and these, these fears, I think, are really strong. And if we take a look at the voting patterns, they, uh, in the Article 7 procedures and so on against Poland, Hungary, we can find a strong East-West uh, uh, divide. But uh, responding to your other question as well on, on um, Euroscepticism in Hungary, yeah, it's, it, Hungary is one of the main beneficiaries of the membership of the European Union per capita. Uh, and I would say that the uh, Euroscepticism of net beneficiaries is a bit different than Euroscepticism of the net payers, because the argument is not that we are just too valuable to be a member of this club, because we are paying the Greek pensions and so on and so on, uh, and the, and the uh, welfare of the of the let's say, poorer states, but the argument is that we are colonies 
of Western multinational companies, and we are second-class citizens. And this kind of frustration of the periphery is something that, that Orban really exploits well. And I think it's important that, that the trust in the European Union is still high in Hungary and still high in Poland. But if you scratch the surface a bit, you find a highly materialistic Uh, understanding of the European Union. We receive money, therefore we know we have to stay in. But uh, Orban invested a lot of effort to destroying the image of the European Union. He still does that. He does a campaign in which he says that Hungary receives zero money from the European Union to to ease the um, impact of the uh, coronavirus. Uh, either the uh, in the healthcare and the economy is totally not true. Uh, And I think what he wants to achieve is to have a strong, uh, Eurosceptic public opinion in Hungary. Uh, let's say something like in Great Britain. And then he would be able to blackmail Western politicians that, okay, if you treat me bad, then I will, I will call for a referendum and we can leave. We are nowhere close to that, I have to tell. These fears over a hooksit uh, have been strong, for example, in the Euro European People's Party. This, they are nowhere close to that. So I don't think we have to be afraid about it now. But at the same time, I think there are some strategic con considerations of Orban. He wants to stay within the EU. He knows that, uh, that it brings a lot of advantages, but he always wants to play, him, uh, pay, play as the role of the guy whose motives on the long run are unpredictable. Okay, um, so that's a, that's a very interesting answer from a psychological point of view. If you look at the narrative and how how he uses the narrative, actually, as you say, to blackmail in a rhetoric way. It's just uh, either we either we will probably follow the British example, even though it's probably not going to happen. Um, before I go to Hannes, I still have another question for you, Peter, because you mentioned already in your in the first uh, statement you gave uh, also the the external actor, and in this uh, sense, you you mentioned. China, uh, and also if especially the China-backed railway link between Budapest and Belgrade. But there are also annual meetings, you know, between, I mean, nearly annual meetings between Viktor Orban and, 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 and Putin. And my question would also be, how big is the influence or how big is the influence of these external actors, in this case, uh, China and Russia, in Hungary, and maybe also compared to the European Union? I mean, just that we have a little bit of a balance where we can assess it a little bit better. Uh, so, uh, Orban makes it crystal clear at this moment that uh, that he thinks that there are uh, more advantages at uh, in the COVID-19 situation of having friends in the East than having friends on the West. Uh, so, what, um, what uh, he told that uh, the Eastern opening is something that uh, was extremely successful. And look at uh, how much have we received from China in, uh, in the form of masks, in the form of tests, in the forms of respirators. We know that this is rather low um, quality, uh, low quality. I, th I think we, we really received some very valuable comments from someone. Uh, so he, we know that these are very low quality Uh, products and, and Hungary bought them. It's, uh, they, these were not given as gifts, but the narrative is that right now it's only China, it's only uh, countries in the Turkey Council, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkmenistan, Turkey, uh, Uzbekistan, that are providing help uh, for Hungary. And uh, we do not receive help from the West, we just receive help from the East. And it's not only the Budapest Belgrade railway station that, that matters here, uh, which is the, far the most important thing, but it just happened that Hungary uh, supported uh, uh, Taiwan's expulsion uh, from the um, Taiwan's expulsion from uh, the uh, General Assembly of the WHO, and uh, therefore Taiwan just could not share its experiences on how to successfully fight COVID-19. And there were not so many uh, supporters from the Western Bloc of China, but uh, Orban was one of them. And uh, he, he made a phone call with Xi Jinping. Uh, the Hungarian authorities forgot to tell it to the Hungarian public that, uh, that they discussed this issue as well, but it, it turned out from the Chinese press and uh, from some... Uh, Uh, from some fringe Hungarian press that they even discussed that. So uh, what I want to tell in short is that Hungary is the 
textbook case of how a a country, if a country turns more illiberal and undemocratic, it opens the door for malign foreign influence either from Russia and for China. That's why the uh, rule of law issues should never be ignored. Hannes, maybe maybe if you can if you can add to that a little bit, or what is the role? Yeah. What how do you see this? I, I think there are. Many elements, or let's say, different uh, intentions. Uh, why uh, there is this uh, leaning towards Xi Jinping and Putin on the other hand? Uh, because I think it's, um, uh, in a way, uh, balancing. As uh, Peter said, we are not only going towards the West; we have also alternative in the East, and that, of course, is very much uh, especially exploited by people in the Balkans, uh, where they are. You know, already saying, well, if the European Union is not taking us, then uh, we have still China, we have still uh, Moscow. The United States is not very attractive, especially not attractive with uh, uh, Putin. So I think this is uh, one way. And the other way is uh, this uh, general authoritarian orientation. You know, the one, the smaller authoritarian people like very often the bigger one. They are the good examples. Um, China, Xi Jinping is managing the the whole uh, COVID uh, issue in, in China very well. Well, uh, he may do it because he has uh, strong measures to do. But on the other hand, the first weeks he just ignored the fact. Even people were punished when they said there is some new new virus. And um, yeah, and of course with Putin is similar. Putin ignored it. Uh, only after some time he said, um, okay. Let's uh, do something because the virus seems to be real. So I think overall there is a, a real uh, um, sympathy uh, towards these uh, people, uh, Putin and Xi Jinping. We, you know, you don't see it only in um, in Hungary. You see it also in some other countries, even in Western European countries, where it is similar. So I think that that's that's a real uh, a real problem. Um, Maybe if I may put a question to to Peter, how do you see now the situation in in the coming weeks? Uh, um, these measures have been lifted. Does it mean uh, there will be some change in the policies, or do you think it will go in that uh, direction, uh, just without this uh, formal uh, legal situation? Or how do you think uh, uh, will it develop? And maybe a second question about the opposition. Um, can it find a way to to re-strengthen their, their influence? You had uh, this uh, municipal election. Uh, will it be repeated or are people disappointed because they cannot do really too much? So that, that would be my, my question to, to, to you. All Thank right. you. Sorry. Um, I'm very yep. sorry, but I mean, um, yes. we have a... To I, make, put, I put a question to Peter. Let Peter, and then you can rearrange your your things. Perhaps. Yeah, Peter, please go ahead. Okay, uh, just just very quickly. First of all, I think um, what what Hans said on 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 uh, Hungary is not the only country that is strongly affected by this authoritarian influence. This is very much. Uh, true, and I think this mass diplomacy that uh, the Russia and China uh, very successfully did, especially at the beginning of the of the crisis, and what Russia did, for example, in Italy, was really brilliant. It costed nothing, but it brought a huge public uh, affairs um, advantage uh, for Russia. I, I think it, it it was it was really brilliant. When it when it comes to the uh, steps in the next weeks. Uh, I, the thing is that the Hungarian government simply does not need the state of emergency anymore because a lot of measures were, make, were, were made uh, regular. So they were made integral part of the legal system. For example, there were some extra taxes on, um, on banks, uh, mostly Austrian banks, and uh, on, um, on retail chains, uh, mostly German ones. And 
originally it was said that it, they will be only in place until the state of emergency in place. But they, they are right now put in the general legal system. And uh, similarly with this, with this um, law of the government to create special economic zones with the municipalities, uh, they cannot just do it by decree uh, uh, as, as part of the state of emergency, but they can do it in normal times as well. So there will be simply no need for keeping the state of emergency or one can do almost whatever he wants, even without that. Uh, and, um, but uh, as I said, and it, it goes to the other question on, on, um, on, the, on the opposition, I think the opposition really faced a hard time in Hungary doing anything. I mean, if you too harshly criticize the government, then the public opinion can turn against you, that you are against the leadership in a times of question of life and death, and you over and you are just politicizing. And these fears were very strong in the opposition. I think probably too strong, uh, because I mean, no crisis can take away your your yeah, let's say, uh, critical perspective if you are in in opposition. On the on the other hand, uh, right now, I think if the economic crisis will deepen, and it's most probably will deepen, uh, the government will suffer from, from its impact. And that's where I think the, the opposition can have uh, an opportunity. Uh, and the next elections are going to be in 2022. Uh, the, uh, if there will be a, an economic crisis that otherwise, I hope not, uh, but if there will be an economic crisis and, uh, and the government is uh, doing visibly very, very little to save the ones in need from the impacts of the economic crisis in Hungary. The unemployment benefits are uh, paid for the shortest term within the European Union, only three months. It was not prolonged. There are just a very minimal money going to save jobs. So if you don't pay on benefits, if you don't pay on jobs and so on. And even right-wing governments in, in the union are doing that uh, and outside the union, like the British, but even the German government, the Polish government are spending much more on social benefits and on, on redistribution. The Hungarian government not. I think it will have an impact on, on the public opinion of the government and it can be, I think, uh, uh, an important moment for the opposition if they can unite and if they can exploit this situation, then I think in 2022, Hungarian government will be in a serious trouble. Yeah. Thank you very much. And sorry for me disappearing, but somebody was uh, intermingling in the, in the chat, unfortunately, and I had to deal with this for, for two minutes. Uh, we already got some questions, though, and I think we can already start with the, with the Q&A section. And the first question goes uh, actually to both of you. And the question is about the role of the European Court of Human Rights in streamlining Hungarian policies in line with the uh, core values and also the role of the European Court of Justice, which seems to be clothed with more powerful instruments to rectify state behavior. So who would like to tackle the first question? I think Hans is definitely better equipped in this topic. Well, uh, one has to say, of course, courts always, if they are correct, they have to stick to the law themselves. They cannot just make political judgments. And therefore, as I said before, the court is um, you know, always trying to see, is it really violating European laws? And there was recent a decision also about the laws concerning asylum seekers, when they said uh, this is illegal what Hungary is doing. And we have uh, we had many cases already in Hungary, for example, um, when uh, ju uh, judges have been sent into into retirement and so on, where the court had a re relatively expensive uh, interpretation of European law, and that was very well. And I must also remind uh, many people that many of the laws uh, drafted by the government, Hungarian government, uh, had to be changed, maybe not as much as we want, and maybe not as uh, dramatically as we want, but because of a decision of the European Court, and as far as I know, um, nearly all uh, decisions of the court have more or less confirmed the intervention of the Commission and not uh, the resistance of Hungary. Maybe there are some exceptions. Uh, but as uh, 
already has been said by Peter, the parliament is more free, they put more pressure. The, co the commission says, well, I have to see if it's really violating European law because if Hungary is going to the court, or Poland for that case, then uh, we want that we get uh, confirmed and not uh, the other side. So it is a difficult uh, trick. Again, uh, as all of Peter already said, that the question is the European Union is a union of still of states, of nation, of governments who could perhaps do more, but every government, especially of course Eastern Europe, says, well, I'm not interfering too much in other countries, maybe uh, we will get some, some problems. What I see, for example, again, the relationship between Austria and our Eastern partners, Austria recently decided also to cut the, the child benefit for people working in Austria, especially also in the 24 hours day, uh, daycare, day and night care. Um, the European the Commission now went to the courts and said, this is illegal, we will see how the decision is taken. So in some way, um, Austria or the Austrian government uh, is not helping the countries in Eastern Europe uh, also on the budget issue, but on the other hand, maybe some as, as compensation for that, they declare themselves uh, symp sympathetic and uh, don't want to interfere too much in, in the uh, government's position of Hungary in many, many cases. So yes, the court can do something, but it is very limited because uh, it must be a real violation of European law. And this is the only possibility where the court can decide against Final remark, we had recently <coughs> a decision of a German, the highest constitutional court in Germany, who was criticizing the European court and in some way saying, we don't have to accept everything the European court is doing. And here's the big fear that now Hungary and Poland and some other countries may say, look, when the German Supreme Court is saying, maybe uh, we can criticize the European court and say the European court is not really um, correctly interpreting European law, we also could say we don't accept what the European Court has decided. As far as I know, uh, Robert already made some remark that the recent decision of the European Court on the refugee issue will perhaps be not respected in Hungary. And if we start with that, that member countries openly say we decide ourselves if we respect the decision of the European Court, that it would be a disaster. This is exactly what, what Russia did with the Court on Human Rights and, and the International Court. Russia made a law in, in, I think it's also now in the new constitution, uh, that uh, finally they have to decide if they decide uh, European Court or not, uh, decision or not. And that is, I think, very dangerous. Yeah, I, I cannot add too much to this uh, brilliant description. Yeah, I, I think uh, European Court of Justice definitely matters, and the infringement procedures, and especially the ones that concluded there, uh, they alterated, uh, they changed the behavior of the government. Of course, the system remained intact. So infringement procedures and the activity of the uh, European Court of uh, Human Rights, it's not... Um, not not uh, possible to change the regimes they can they could modify it at some elements for example in 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 the case of of uh, media authority in the case of the change of the jurisdiction and so far orban um, so far the hungarian government always followed the rulings uh, of the european court probably until now. We don't know how seriously we should take the words of the justice minister in Hungary, but he told that the latest decision uh, of the European court that, uh, that practically calls the authorities to not use the detention um, centers or the in the transit zone as they did before, uh, the justice minister told that he will ignore this decision. I'm not sure he will. In a lot of cases, the Hungarian the governments are talking much more legally populistically than they act. I mean, they trust more the European legal system than they usually act, uh, they do, because they, they are 
I mean, this is government that's full of lawyers and they have a lawyer logic. They know how to play with the rules. But by the end of the day, they rather try to uh, make tricks within uh, the legal um, boundaries. So that's why I think it, it still remains important, but nobody should expect that it, it changes the character of the regime. It, it might be some really small victories in a big, huge battle in which, in which Orban could, could uh, proceed and go further and further. Um, I have another question for Peter, um, and this person, she, uh, he or she asks um, if uh, there is a danger that the other Visegrad states will follow the example of Hungary. How would you assess this? And maybe yeah. also following, following up on this, um, um, another question is um, quite interesting also that the vice president, commission vice president, uh, um, supported uh, Fidesz in the beginning and asked for an apology from the EPP. And once she clarified the position uh, and said that the possibility of actually suspending European Union funds can be considered, Orban then said that the state of emergency will be cancelled soon. So the question therefore is, uh, if this doesn't show that financial pressure does have immediate and strong effects on Hungarian politics. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a really good and important observation. And Orban always tells, and he sometimes pretends that he doesn't care about criticism, he doesn't care about pressure. When it comes to hard decisions, especially on money, he definitely cares. Uh, <clears throat> this gentleman <clears throat> who I already mentioned, uh, Lurinc Mészáros, the wealthiest man on, in Hungary, uh, very, very, very close friend to the prime minister, he received two thirds of his wealth from EU funds, uh, which shows that EU funds are not only important for the development of the country and to keep the economic figures um, on, on a high level. And, and there was really considerable economic growth in Hungary in the last few years, but also for, for private reasons. So I think it's definitely right that, uh, that um, this is the language that Orban understands. And it's sad to say that, but uh, the... Uh, gestures that are in a lot of cases exercised towards him, it's like he just takes them and does nothing in turn. So he uh, gestures are just regarded from power politics um, point of view as signs of weakness and treated as such. So unfortunately, it's uh, I think this, these are the um, signs that, that Orban rather understands. And with all being, this being said, if the emergency situation is out, Orban still can mo uh, mostly do what, what he wants. When it comes to other Visegrad countries following the same route, I think it's already happening. The reason why after 2015, the Polish government could uh, uh, take a very similar path an even quicker path than what, what Orban took, I think is that they could observe the example of Viktor Orban uh, taking a lot of money from the European Union, uh, ignoring its core values, bashing the European Union quite spectacularly and trying to destroy its image and still keep, um, staying in the European mainstream, in the EPP, and without any serious sanctions or, or countermeasures. And that's what I think is really dangerous. Orban is a model in all Central Eastern Europe. If you want to govern for a long time, here is the way how you can do that. And he's not only a model in Central Eastern Europe, he's a model in Western Balkans as well. He's practically a personal coach of, of, uh, of the Serbian president. Also, he has very good ties with, um, with Montenegro. He has his friends in Macedonia. One of them, he already invited to Budapest and he enjoys uh, Nikola Gruevski, Hungarian uh, ho uh, hospitality. Uh, he he um, establishes strong links in uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, especially Republika Srpska. So, uh, there is a soft power and sharp power projection of Hungary to the Western Balkans, and uh, and and Orban is treated as a as a real model there. So that's that's why I think uh, if if Orban's actions remain without consequences, then many others can follow this way. Would you like to add something to that, Hannes? Well, I think that that, that is a. Uh, very, very important argument. Uh, we are dealing a lot uh, of our institute uh, uh, with the Balkans. If we are not very clear that human rights, civil rights, uh, respect uh, for, for these rights is a center of 
the European values or principles, then uh, we are just uh, a bunch of states who have some, maybe some economic interest, some political interest, but that's not Europe. That's not what we fought for uh, or our ancestors fought for after the Second World War. And therefore, I think we should absolutely insist on these principles and be very critical of all those who deviate uh, so strongly like Orban. He is not the only one. If we look, for example, you mentioned the question of, of corruption and nepotism. If you uh, look to the Czech Republic, where big demonstrations against even the prime minister is accused of, uh, uh, you know, taking a lot of the funds uh, for himself. We have problems in Slovakia and some other countries. Uh, unfortunately, at least in the public, it's more the Eastern European countries. Also, there is also surely on the Western part uh, of Europe. But um, many, many people are disappointed that this kind of enlargement was not bringing more democratic values and, and principles to it. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question which deals with the role of civil society in Hungary. Peter, maybe you can tell us a little bit how is the situation with the civil society? Is it still active? I mean, it seems to be quite difficult, even especially now after uh, in this uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic. And of course, you, we already talked a little bit about the, the, the law on the fake news. And, and so how do you see it? Is it vivid these days? And is it going on the streets? It, does it have a, lo uh, a, a loud voice also concerning I mean, the, the transgender uh, law you just mentioned al already earlier? Yes, I, I think the uh, civil society in Hungary under very strong pressure since 2010, and especially since 2012, where some of you can remember that a uh, uh, leader of uh, one of the uh, civic organizations that were distributing the Norway grants were brought to the police, and it, it, there was a very strange case of harassment of, of NGOs. It turned out, interestingly, that... that uh, the highest authority who undersigned the paper that allowed uh, this interrogation to happen was Viktor Orban himself. Uh, and he, Viktor Orban himself told back to 2014 in his infamous illiberalism programmatic speech that uh, one of the main enemies of his regime that he said back then practically lost its opposition uh, is, is, is the are the NGOs. And I think under this pressure and counterattacks, the NGOs could really, um, in Hungary, um, broaden their, uh, let's say, mobilization potential and their, their supporters, and also, I think, amplify their voices. On the other hand, the problem is that if you are a human rights NGO in Hungary these days, you simply do not have an access to the groups that you aim to represent, because if you cannot go to schools, if you cannot go to prisons, if you cannot go to detention centers, to the to the transit zone, then how can you meet with the people that you would like to represent uh, and and to help uh, legally? So it's it's increasingly challenging, and uh, and I think there is a bad expectation towards the NGOs in Hungary that, you know, they should be the sources of political change. Well, this is, I think, simply not the, not the function of the, of the uh, civil society. And, but there, there is this, this um, expectation. And um, I think the, the positive aspect of that is that uh, the Hungarian civil society improved a lot. On the other hand, we still don't have this huge, let's say, capacity of organizing big masses like we can, I think, more see in Poland, for example. So there are unfortunately not as big, let's say, feminist demonstrations in Hungary like what we can, uh, we can see in, in Poland. So I think it's still, there are uh, an import, a lot of important things to do to, to develop, but the NGO sector became and the civil sector became more cooperative and I think overall way more efficient and more grassroots than it was before. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. My uh, last question would be on, on the, on the post-pandemic political world. Maybe the question goes to both of you. I mean, um, how, do you, how do you assess the situation after COVID? I mean, from a Hungarian point of view, but then probably also like a little bit a larger picture. I mean, we also have still ongoing problems. I mean, we should talk also about environmental issues. We, we talk about security, like what are the real threats and, uh, and how, is, how is the future going to look like from your point of view? And uh, maybe we start with um, Peter again and, and then Hannes to add there. 
Well, I, I will be really short. I am really curious what, what Hans is going to say to this, this question. I think history is in the making. So there, I don't really uh, believe in deterministic um, historical explanations. I don't think that uh, this crisis have the nature of uh, creating more evil, more closed, more, uh, more uh, hateful societies. And I think we can see quite a lot of uh, responses on national level and the local level that points towards higher solidarity, higher uh, redistribution, a more, let's say, sober science-based, evidence-based policy making. But we, we see totally different examples as well. And there is a very strange situation now in most of the countries in the European Union that there is a really around the flag effect. Governing parties, more, most of them within the European Union are enjoying higher levels of, of confidence and trust from the citizens. I don't think it will long last. Uh, when, when this COVID crisis turns into a deep um, uh, economic crisis that, that uh, politicians have to muddle through, I think the ones who are on government now will suffer. Populists on government, like in Hungary, they will suffer. But Democrats and mainstream politicians in government, like in, let's say, in Germany, they will, I would expect, suffer as well. So I, that's why I think we, we cannot really describe the, the post-COVID uh, word in, in, in simple terms, or I at least can't. Hannes, well, I, I think uh, in, in following up what, what Peter said, I think the politicians already in most of the countries noticed that there is a danger of this full support and this orientation on the decision uh, up in the government without looking too much into parliamentary procedure, that uh, this could change and skip and people became a bit more critical if that's really necessary, what is they doing here? Because some of them saw that or had the fear that it will be used also after the pandemic crisis uh, in order to control more citizens' behavior and to track uh, uh, what they are doing. So I think uh, the, the question of civil rights is, is very important that we insist that uh, emergency measures are here for emergency, but not for the time afterwards. And democratic processes, deliberations have to be re-established. The second element, of course, is the social issue. I think there are new cleavages. We see it economically. Of course, there are people who are in job and people who lost a job. And people who I heard today that some of the companies rather sacked people because they thought afterwards, I choose the best one, uh, and the younger one I get back, and the rest stays unemployed, and the state has to care for it. So, so that I see is some danger that this kind of cleavage and, and split will be here. We see those in schools. We have many young people who are not in school. Now, Peter, you and um, myself, my, my friends here are living here, uh, relatives, they can teach with, the, uh, learn with the children, but there are many people who can't. We have not the instruments, and even if they have a computer, but to, to use it is very difficult. So we see also the danger of splitting up our younger generation between those who can follow uh, on the virtual digital way and those who cannot or not, or not as easily. And then the third question I would say is, of course, the whole ecological question. Uh, we can be happy if now there are less uh, emissions, uh, CO2 and so on, but that is uh, a momentarily ac ac actual situation. But in the long run, we have to, to convince our citizens that we have to do things in order to keep our world intact. And uh, the, the ecological issues, the uh, issue of climate change are still here. Um, so the Green Deal, which was proposed by the Commission, uh, must be implemented and must be implemented in many countries. If it's done in, here in the country A and the country B alone, that's, that's not enough. So I think uh, to politics and political system comes a lot of new tasks um, which have not yet been dealt with in the past in, in a serious way. We always discussed on the issues of a CO2 tax and so on, but we don't have it in reality. And uh, this is also what the European Union, and this, uh, with this I want to end, has to do. They have to think not only about institutional issues, but they have to think about what are the contents we have to do, including also on the health issue. And this is really my final thing. 
on health issue, you can very much see you need something you have to do on the national and on the European level to have enough uh, medicine, enough uh, masks and, and instruments, but you need international cooperation. So without the international cooperation, uh, the next epidemic will come and uh, cannot be dealt with in, in, a, in, a, in a more quicker way. So I think there's a lot of uh, changes because, not because of the endemic maybe, but where the endemic shows that changes in the structure of our societies and our politics is necessary in order to fulfill the desires and the, the wishes of our citizens, uh, and that with preserving the basic civil rights. Um, I actually already wanted to end here, but I got another question, and I think it's also worth that we probably just take a look at this one, because it's um, uh, about the last local elections, and Fidesz lost in an unprecedented way in many larger cities, but the countryside uh, remained with Fidesz. So the question is, if we manage to communicate better, if you manage to communicate better with the countryside, can and could this probably bring a wider political change? I would say the question directly goes to uh, Peter, and I say this is not so. You can also then um, give your final statement together with this question, probably. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is very important. That that while in the big cities, uh, the opposition could improve its positions and and. Uh, Gain and take over very uh, important cities. I mean, uh, cities that are um, leading uh, counties and so on. But on the other hand, in small small settlements, Fidesz is still strong. It's even stronger than before. So what we can observe in Hungary, I think, is not not uh, not only not necessarily a Budapest. Uh, versus yeah uh, countryside divide but it's much more a big city versus small town and villages divide and this is this is a huge driver of populism these days everywhere uh, and this is what uh, i think orban to rather strengthen this cleavage and it, it's very interesting that uh, before, uh, let's even around 2016, there was a common wisdom in Hungary that you cannot win elections if you don't take the capital. Uh, there are only two million inhabitants of Budapest, why the country has 10 million, but still you have to take the capital, and it's not the way. It's not the way anymore. So you can win elections against the capital, and uh, and uh, it's it's a huge challenge. How can you go down to the level of small villages where uh, the elder population automatically switches on the public television? The public television, which is really the cheapest propaganda channel of of the government that you can imagine, compared to which Russia today is really represents the highest levels of and standards of journalism. And how can you? What what can you do? Uh, the interesting thing is that. And a lot of people uh, in the countryside, in the smaller villages, are voting for Fidesz despite the fact that they are just losing uh, their their uh, money, they're losing their income, and they are just becoming poorer and poorer. And I think Orban is very good in, in symbolic politics and giving pride to, to uh, Hungarians for the ones who feel they need this kind of national pride and how to challenge it. I think the the uh, opposition has to be stronger in symbolic politics as well. I think that, yeah, talking about uh, social inequalities, talking about policies are essentially important, but I think the main winning point of Fidesz is rather in symbolic politics. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think with uh, this we can we can close already. Thank you very much for taking your time. I think it was very interesting to take a look to see from within Hungary how the situation is, how you perceive it, and you, I think you raised many many important issues. I mean, also what comes afterwards. I mean, you mentioned solidarity. I think is very important. Also, this idea of redistribution, but then also how symbolic uh, politics actually function. And I would say this is not only for Hungary the case, but we experience uh, probably in a less extent but we also experienced this in in Austria for example so um, thank you very much uh, for for taking your time Peter thank you very much Hannes also for taking your time and of course to all the participants especially those um, not intermingling with the chat function thank you very much for taking interest um, hope to see you soon and hope everyone stays safe and healthy in the upcoming days and let's look to a bright uh, future together again in the European Union thank you very much have a nice evening 
Thank you very Thank much. You for the brilliant moderation, Stephanie. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.